Hi everyone, and welcome to this updated tutorial byte for Oxford Not Included, where we're re-looking at meteor showers. These have changed significantly since I made the original tutorial byte on this topic, and at that point, spaced out DLC maps didn't even have meteor showers, except for the Raglith planetoid. That means a lot has changed, so again I'm going to cover what meteor showers are, and how to protect your base from them. Meteor showers are regular events that will happen at the top of the map in the space biome, and can be an important part of the mid and late game. They last between 50 and 400 seconds, and during these periods, meteors will fall from the sky. There are many types of meteors, and these are grouped into events, where two or three different meteor types will fall in the same shower. Each meteor leaves behind different materials of differing temperatures, and may or may not cause damage when they land. Now the events don't happen all of the time, so on a timeline, meteor showers look something like this. There are periods of active showers and calm periods, which give you time to deal with cleaning up past meteor showers or preparing for the next ones. And as a quick note, there is now a meteor shower difficulty setting, so you can actually disable them completely, reduce the number of meteors, or increase the numbers by up to four times using the doomsday setting if you're feeling adventurous. So getting into the specifics then, Meteor Showers are slightly different between the base game and the Spaced Out DLC. I'm going to tackle the base game quickly first, and of course timestamps are available if you want to jump to any specific sections. Now in the base game, Meteor Showers are always the same, and come in three seasons of Iron, Copper Ore and Gold Amalgam, and then repeats. There is randomness in the exact timings, so they cannot be easily predicted. But each of these seasons carries the same Meteors except that the Metal Meteor changes based on the season. Metal Meteors are of a medium size and speed, and their colour depends on the type of metal it contains and drops on impact. These are purple for refined iron, red for copper ore, and green for gold amalgam. And then there are the Rock Meteors, which are large and slow moving. As well as causing damage, they leave behind hot natural regolith tiles that must be dealt with. I'll explain how to detect and deal with the meteors later on, so let's now look at the Spaced Out DLC meteor showers. Here there are many more types, and which ones you get depend on each planetoid and map type. You can see which meteor showers affect each planetoid in the info card in the star map when clicking on a planetoid. Note that the outer six planetoids are always the same, and mostly do not have showers. The exceptions are the Moo planetoid, which has meteors which drop new gassy moos regularly. These are non-damaging and cause no problems. For more information on gassy moves, see the dedicated critter tutorial byte. The regolith planetoid has regolith, metal and ice meteor events, which is very similar to the base game, leaving behind hot regolith, metals and ice. All of these meteors, except for the ice, are damaging, so building here is tricky. But the regolith does feed the shove voles that live on this planetoid. There is also a fullering meteor event, which happens when the temporal tear opener is activated on the frozen planetoid, and these should be periodic, but seem to stop once the game is reloaded. But none of the other outer planetoids have any meteor showers, so may be easier to build on. So for the inner planetoids, there are seven types of shower that can happen. These are the iron, copper and gold metal meteor showers like in the base game, but then also four new ones of oxalite, ice, slime or uranium. As I already covered iron, copper and gold in the base game section, let's start with oxalite meteor showers. Like all of the spaced out showers, the clue is really in the name. Oxalite meteors drop oxalite, which is a solid that off gases into oxygen when the pressure is low, for example in space. As they disappear by themselves if left, and cause no damage on impact, these meteors are a flow concern and the oxalite they bring can be useful as either rocket oxidizer or in just making oxygen for tubes. Note that the solid oxalite tiles will entomb buildings, which can cause issues, but will quickly disappear by themselves. Next then is the slimy meteor event, which naturally brings slime meteors, as well as algae and phosphoric meteors. These bring slime, algae and phosphorite, and again do not cause damage on impact. And while these materials do all have their uses, the annoying thing about slime meteors is that the slime tiles they leave behind are solid and do not fall. This makes clearing them out slightly more challenging, and I'll touch on this later. Ice meteor events bring cold ice and snow meteors, which don't cause damage, but do form solid ice and snow tiles that fall down like regolith unless they melt. So generally these aren't harmful, but can entomb buildings, meaning they need to be protected or dug out. 
And the last type for spaced out is uranium meteor events, which bring uranium and dust meteors. Overall probably the rarest and most annoying of the spaced out meteor showers, the dust meteors can cause damage and uranium meteors leave behind solid uranium ore tiles. The uranium ore is quite a useful renewable source of making enriched uranium for nuclear reactors, but these solid tiles are very hard and can't be dug by robo miners. This makes clearing them very difficult. Finally then, unique to the Frosty Planet Pack DLC, and available in both the base game and spaced out, is the Icy Nectar Meteor Shower. This is very similar to the Ice Meteor Showers, bringing snow and ice, but also comes with bonbon tree seeds which will plant themselves into wild bonbon trees. Also like the Ice Meteor Showers, the Icy Nectar Showers do not have any damaging meteors. So having covered all of the types of meteors and meteor showers, let's now look at how to detect them and deal with them. Meteor showers occur with somewhat random durations and intervals, so you can't simply use a timer. Detecting them is done with a space scanner. These are a bit hard as sensors, but very simply they detect meteor showers before they start. Each scanner has a scan quality from 0 to 100%, and to keep this strong it needs clear access to space. It will check a V-shape going upwards, and needs to be at least 15 tiles below the top of the map. To get a clear view, there can only be open doors and mesh or airflow tiles above it. Window tiles will partially block the scanning as well as absorb light, so mesh tiles are better to use. The scanner also has a requirement to not have any other heavy machinery nearby, so keep machines and other space scanners at least 14 tiles away. Each scanner can reach 100% scan quality, and when this is the case, it will contribute 24% to the overall network quality. This means 5 are needed to get 100% network quality. Each scanner will detect the same meteor shower at different times, between 0 and 200 seconds before it starts, and then send a green automation signal we can use. And as a tip here, remember to use steel for automation wires that cross any rocket launch areas. The network quality is the most important factor, and what it does is improve the minimum warning time that the earliest scanner will give. This is guaranteed to be double the network strength in seconds. If the details are a bit confusing, then the key point is now only one space scanner with clear line of sight is needed if you want to use an automation signal with meteor showers. For automation, space scanners are used with a NOT gate because they send a green signal when there is a meteor shower coming, so usually you want a red signal to close the doors. But in the Space Out DLC, meteor shower events can also be seen on the star map. They will appear as unknown events that can be seen heading towards a planetoid. With a telescope in range on any planetoid or rocket that the meteor shower passes, then the meteor shower can be revealed, giving you some notice. So we now know what they are and when they're coming, then how can we deal with them? There are four different methods I'm going to demonstrate, and each one has advantages and disadvantages with each type of meteor shower. And actually the first one is to not really do anything at all. By this I mean let the meteors fall and hit things. Now obviously this is the only thing you can do in the early game, but for non-damaging meteor showers, the not doing anything is not the worst option. For example, oxalite meteors will just turn to oxygen by themselves, so don't cause problems. And ice won't overheat buildings, but will need to be dug out. That does mean some manual digging, but only every 20 cycles or so, so isn't too big of a problem. Then of course the next way to deal with them is to block them, for example with tiles. This stops the meteors hitting other buildings, but lets material build up. But if you don't want to use parts of the map for solar panels or rockets, then this is a perfectly good idea. Do be careful of the damaging meteors though, which will cause damage and can break tiles. It is still possible to just repair and replace them, and let the meteor material build up above to make its own natural barrier again. But to avoid any damage, you'll want bunker tiles. These are quite expensive at 100 kilograms of steel each, but do not take any meteor damage at all. For help with getting steel, see the dedicated steel and plastic tutorial bite. So tiles are fine for closed areas, but if you want to use solar panels or rockets, then we need to clear a path. We can use simple mechanised airlocks if the meteors are non-damaging, and control them with a signal from the space scanner with a knot gate. But for damaging meteors, bunker doors are needed to stop any damage. These buildings are 4 tiles wide, and like bunker tiles are made from steel at 500 kilograms each. Like the airlocks, we can use the same automation signal to open them, but if unpowered they will take 400 seconds to do so, meaning they really need to be powered. 
When powered, they then open in 44 seconds and close in 39 seconds. But note that they need 120 watts when doing this, so you can have 8 on a normal wire or 16 on a conductive wire without overloading it. Beware that if you are launching rockets through doors like this, then mechanised airlocks and any power or automation wires need to be steel, tungsten, niobium or thermium to avoid melting. As an aside for placement, I would recommend putting these very high to give you space to build. I like to leave two tiles to the very top of the red zone, and remember to choose whether to use doors or tiles, depending on if you need access or not. I also want to mention here that meteors fall mostly downwards, so you actually want to avoid building a box as shown on the left, as it uses a lot of steel. Instead, build across the top and add some extra tiles or doors either side to catch meteors that come in at a small angle. I've added about 10 tiles here either side, and for comparison, this design needs 3 tons of steel, and the left design needs 8.7 tons. So to actually protect against meteors, we can ladder up and across and put in doors and tiles, using bunker doors and bunker tiles for planetoids with damaging meteor showers, including the base game. I've run a conductive wire up here to provide power for the bunker doors in this example, and below there is a rocket and solar panel that we want to use and keep safe as an example. Now the key to setting this up is automation, and how and when to open the doors. We can do this very simply with a space scanner and a NOT gate, but this is still not an ideal setup. We need to deal with the materials left behind, otherwise when the doors open, solid tiles may still be blocking the way, or falling tiles will fall and bury things. The most reliable way to deal with both types is to use robo miners. This is an intuitive method, and simply digs the tiles before opening a set of doors. Note that for non-damaging meteors, the top level of bunker doors is not needed at all. By putting a tile above each miner, they are protected from being buried, and using these together allows all the materials to be dug. Spacing between the robo miners is important here, as to dig all of the material, you can have a gap of 6 between the miners. But rockets are 7 tiles wide, so to use these with the miners, there will be one tile above each robo miner that can't be dug. These miners will also generate heat when drilling, as will launching rockets past them, so there is a cooling loop that runs behind the miners with conduction panels to stop them overheating. For more information on cooling, see the cooling tutorial byte. In this example, I've also included auto sweepers and conveyor loaders, again called with conduction panels, to collect the materials left behind, but you can make this without these too. So the top doors open if you have them for damaging meteors, then after enough time has passed, the bottom doors then open. The automation here isn't too complicated, and the scanner output from the NOT gate still runs to the top set of doors. Then a filter gate delays the green signal to the bottom doors to give the miners enough time to clear the debris and for the auto sweepers to sweep if you have them. I found the typical drilling time after opening is around 200 seconds, so for the minimum time on the filter gate, I would use this if you're using bunker doors, but not auto sweepers. If you don't need the top doors, then the miners can drill as the shower happens, so you'll need less time. And for auto sweeping, it's hard to give a specific number, because it depends on the meteor shower type and how many conveyor rails are used. An extra 30 seconds is not a bad starting point, but you may want longer if you really need the resources, or alternatively, just collect them on top of tiles, or below at the surface. Then, after the time on the filter gate passes, all the material is dug out, and anything not swept will fall as harmless debris. To make this design a little more advanced, we can also use the second use of the space scanner. By default, they detect meteor showers, but you can also have them track rockets returning. This is useful to open the doors when rockets return during a meteor shower. When used this way, they don't actually need line of sight to space, but are most conveniently placed near the door automation. They send green when the rocket is returning, so the logic is easy. Join us with an OR gate to the Meteor Scanning Scanner. This will potentially let some meteors through, but is probably better than breaking the doors. Now the only thing the robo miners don't work for is uranium meteors, which leave solid uranium ore behind. These are too hard to be mined by the miner and do not fall, so as far as I'm aware, digging these out every time with dupes is the only option, unless you use the last method, the Meteor Blaster. Since the original version of this video was made, the Meteor Blaster has now been added. This building shoots down meteors with blast shot, 
destroying them and leaving 25% of the materials behind as debris. That makes it the simplest and most reliable way to keep the sky clear. I would recommend overlapping a few tiles between their ranges, shown in blue, as they work better in pairs. Sometimes meteors will still get through if you only have one covering a part of the sky. Note too that these make heat constantly, so like robo miners in space, they need a cooling loop with conduction panel to keep cool. Blast shot itself then is made in the simply named blast shot maker. Each shot takes 5 kilograms of a refined metal and 10 kilograms of petroleum, which is piped in. This building also needs a dupe with a tier 3 pyrotechnic skill, found at the bottom of the skill tree, to use it. Once made, I like to water sweep the blast shot into a conveyor loader and then conveyor rail them up to the blasters for automatic loading there. Using these, you can simply leave the sky open and use the space biome as you wish. So having covered all of the methods, here's a quick summary table on each method and each meteor shower type. And so that's all there is to meteor showers in oxygen not included. I hope this gives you more information to access space safely, and thanks for watching.